Good, good evening. Um, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Moore, and I co-teach the Wellesley College Lake by Call course with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Tom Hodge, right here. All right. Now, Tom and I were very excited last fall when Dr. Kate Pride Brown accepted our invitation to deliver this spring lecture here at Wellesley College. Dr. Brown is an environmental sociologist with nearly as many prizes and publications to her name as she has interests. Her interests range from globalization to social groups and civil society to social theory to water conservation and water conflict resolution. She received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College in 2003 and her MA and PhD degrees from Vanderbilt uh, University. Now, three years ago, she became an assistant professor in sociology at the Georgia Institute for Technology. And this evening, she is speaking about her, her dissertation research, which she conducted in the Lake Baikal region of Siberia, thanks to a Fulbright Fellowship. And while in Siberia, she explored the shifting power dynamics among local environmental groups, a capitalist corporation, and the Russian state. Uh, the result is this remarkably engaging book titled Saving the Sacred Sea, uh, which you might think would interest only Russianists or people with some connection to Lake Baikal, which is the Sacred Sea. But tonight you will learn that this book contains lessons for everyone with an interest in the environment and civic activism. The title of her talk tonight is Environmental Activism and Power Dynamics in Russia. Kate. Thank you, Dr. Moore. It is an absolute pleasure to be here at Wellesley, so thank you for the invitation. So tonight I will be offering you a new perspective on social movements and activism. And in order to do that, I will be taking you to a really amazing place, a place that is uh, truly one of the wonders of the world, and that place is Lake Baikal. So Lake Baikal, just circled in red there, is uh, located in eastern Siberia, just north of Mongolia. Um, Baikal has a number of superlative titles and attributes that render it utterly unique in the natural world. First, Baikal is old. It is the oldest existing, currently existing lake on Earth. It's estimated to have been formed between 25 and 35 million years ago when the Indian subcontinent collided with Asia. So the same process that gave us the Himalayans also gave us Lake Baikal. It literally split two uh, tectonic plates apart, so it just uh, is a pulled the part of the fault line, um, and it's an ongoing process. It can, just as the Himalayans continue to rise, Baikal continues to widen at about the rate of two centimeters per year. But it is not the width of Baikal that astounds us, it is its depth. So Baikal is deep. It is the deepest lake on Earth. It is uh, more than a mile down to its, from the surface to the sediment floor, and the sediment is estimated to be about four miles beneath that. It's a very deep lake. It's the deepest lake on Earth. Uh, and it is, um, it is filled with about 330 inflowing rivers and streams that went into this giant crack in the Earth and filled it up. So Baikal is huge. <laughs> it is the most voluminous lake on Earth as well. You know the Great Lakes? We have some Great Lakes. All of them could fit inside Lake Baikal. It holds about 20% of Earth's surface fresh water, unfrozen surface fresh water. Uh, so it is a natural reservoir of global proportions. And curiously, this deep, deep lake is oxygenated all the way to its maximum depth. Most other deep lakes uh, cannot hold oxygen below about 650 feet, and everything below that is dead zone. But by call, for some reason, water churns, and it, it has oxygen all the way to the bottom, which means it also supports life at the bottom. And there are many unique species that are adapted to this environment and have fostered a, a really vibrant ecosystem. So Baikal is alive. It has um, a, more than 4,000 known endemic species that are found nowhere else on Earth. And these, uh, these endemic species range from the microscopic, 
So for example, the Epistura bicalensis, which is a, a little microscopic shrimp that filter feeds through the water. Uh, and species like this one um, are responsible for another one of Baikal's uh, amazing uh, superlative features. The water is exceptionally pure. It is almost pure H2O. It's so pure, in fact, that it's not even really recommended for drinking because it doesn't have the minerals that we usually receive from water. <laughs> it's that pure. Uh, it's so clean, in fact, that frozen Baikal water is as transparent as glass. Baikal is also home to charismatic, charismatic megafauna, like the endemic Baikal seal. Oh, this is the Nerpa. So this is uh, the world's only purely freshwater seal, landlocked in the middle of Siberia. So it has seals. And in addition to the Nerpa, the charismatic me megafauna that is the Nerpa, you have its exceptionally charismatic offspring. <laughs> there you go, the Nerpionic. The baby Nerpa. Uh, the Nerpa is essentially the totem of Baikal. It is its, its symbol. And so you find its likeness adorning everything from you know, plush toys and snow globes to t-shirts to storefronts. The Nerpa is the totem of Lake Baikal. It's also the totem of another uh, to, of Baikal environmental activism. So you can see these, these protesters here all bearing placards with images of the Nerpa or the Nerpionic. Um, Baikal activism can be considered another endemic species of sorts at, at Lake Baikal because Lake Baikal, uh, the region around Lake Baikal, was home to the first environmental movement in Russia. So this is just another poster of the NERPA. Um, the, uh, what's still more impressive about, about environmental activism at Baikal and, it's, and this original protest movement, this original Russian environmental movement, is that it took place in the 1950s during the Soviet Union. So a regime that was not usually considered tolerant of dissent witnessed a massive um, uh, campaign of letter writers and conferences, scientists and literary figures trying to uh, protect and preserve Lake Baikal. And the instigator was this. So at the time, uh, the government wanted to build a paper mill on the shore of Lake Baikal that would then dump its, its toxic effluvia into the lake. And it was really one of the, the first time that we've documented of people st standing up and publicly saying, no, no, you can't do this, and, and um, massively coming out across the, the Soviet Union in support of this, this emblem of uh, this, really, this national treasure. Um, it was not a fight they won, clearly, because you can see the plant. Um, but it did have uh, some success in so far as uh, getting the government to stall construction and to promise to put in the, the cleanest technologies possible and, and um, placate environmentalist concerns. Uh, so environmental activism has existed in some form ever since at, at, uh, at Lake Baikal. And when Perestroika allowed for the first free association and free opportunity to independently protest, uh, the region around Lake Baikal was also home to the very first protest picket march in the Soviet Union that was not affiliated with the Communist Party. And it was, again, for the protection of nature. So as a sociologist, I found this case absolutely fascinating. And I thought, here's a, here's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to examine uh, activism across very dr dramatically different political economic regimes. So I traveled there. Uh, I went to Irkutsk, which is a capital city located near um, Lake Baikal, and spent 10 months there doing ethnographic field work as a participant observer amongst environmental activist groups based in Irkutsk, um, including also uh, conducting side, and side trips to their partner organizations that were located in Moscow, Seattle, South Lake Tahoe, and San Francisco. I conducted about 20, 52 semi-structured interviews with members of the environmentalist community and some of their partners and anyone else, I mean, some government agencies, people who were involved in environmental protection in the region. And I also spent time uh, perusing some state archives of the All-Soviet Society for Nature Protection and um, some newspapers based in some of the heavy industrial cities in Baikalsk and Angarsk. So, now we're going to go up to the stratosphere and talk about very abstract social theory. <laughs> so bear with me. So there's this term civil society, and civil society um, 
is sort of a, a catch-all term that social scientists use to discuss things that we see taking place in, in human societies that is not government, and it's not the economy, and it's not individuals doing their private things in their homes and their families and their own private lives. This is where those things that happen that take place where people, groups come together and cooperate to achieve something that they have collectively decided is a good thing to do. And so this is um, everything from from environmental activism to starting a chess club to uh, having, I don't know, um, uh, poetry reading, grooming, that, this is all kinds of civil society. Um, so it represents the outpouring of voluntary initiative whereby people cooperate to achieve some self-determined end. So all activism is considered part of civil society, but civil society itself as a concept goes beyond protest movements and activism. And uh, theories of civil society have long seen the, this, pro this phenomenon of people coming together independently as the foundation of democratic government. And very often in the modern literature of civil society, which uh, partly came out of um, protest movements at the end of the Cold War and also in, in Latin America against authoritarian regimes down there, they've seen civil society as being uh, a kind of a check on state power or sometimes a check on the power uh, of corporate elites. And I often describe these as, as having a, being sort of Montesquieuian notions of civil society that's acting as this, this, this balance of power to these other powerful interests, um, which is not a totally inaccurate portrayal, but it al is also incomplete in my opinion. And the term is not without other criticism. So some scholars uh, have criticized civil society as being too lumpy of a term. The idea being, well, yes, if it's chess clubs and it's, and it's um, Earth First, like what do they actually have to do with each other? Why are we talking about these in the same messy term? Maybe we, uh, we need something that's a bit more precise to parse out these various components of civil society. Uh, it also was critiqued as, uh, I say, maybe being too naive and that it has this long association as be of being a uh, foundation of democratic government, but technically the KKK is civil society. Is that pro-democracy? Well, it's questionable, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe there, we have a lot of aspects of people coming together voluntarily to do some very undemocratic things. Um, so uh, perhaps civil society as a theory is failing us in this regard. However, I think that there actually is something that can connect chess clubs and, and Earth First. And uh, I think that I can also uh, alleviate this problem of having a, a good side and a bad side of civil society if we think about civil society differently. So it requires us to recognize and reconceptualize civil society not as something that what it is, like chess clubs, but rather what it does. And what it does, I argue, is uh, to rely upon people's sense of what is good and right, that they're willing to give of themselves voluntarily to achieve some end. So they're a user of power, this power that comes from mobilizing people uh, from their goodwill and voluntarily. Um, so it's not just a check on power, it succeeds in being a check on power because it is a form of power and we need to take that more seriously and to recognize this, this is power in itself. When uh, civil society groups are in fact confronting um, you know, autocratic states or, or um, behemoth corporations, they are checking them precisely because their visions don't align. So it's, 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 they have as much a vision of their own they want to see and that they're trying to put into place using their own power source as they are simply checking larger power sources. And when you look at the relationship between these actors, it opens up this thing that I call the field of power. So the field of power is the space where groups vie, for the strength, vie over the strength and the generalizability of their particular power source to enact their particular social vision and produce social change. And that, importantly, this is the ability to do this in any social field, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, no, I'll talk about that now. <laughs> so, so basically, there's lots of different kinds of power, but not all powers are generalizable. So let's say, um, as a uh, professor at Wellesley, then I have some influence over my, you know, what I have some power over my students perhaps, or power over the curricula or something to that nature, but I don't have any ability to influence, say, what movies get made in Hollywood. My power is, is contingent on my position in a particular place, but I argue that there are some forms of power that are generalizable. 
So to be a player in the field of power, you need a generalizable power source that could operate regardless of whether you're at Wellesley or Hollywood. Um, this is a kind of a meta level power that can exert its influence in any social field. And I argue that there are three of these uh, generalizable power sources. So one is, is the power over the state. The state writes laws by which we live and it has the means to enforce them. It has the monopoly over legitimate force and violence within a sovereign territory. So within the sovereign territory of the state, the state writes the rules and that is a major form of power. You can write laws about media or about higher ed or whatever it is, it's generalizable within that space. Money is an abstraction. It's an abstraction of exchange value. You can buy anything with money and therefore it has relatively equal value across all social fields. If you have a lot of this abstract value, you can exchange it wherever you are. It can have influence wherever you are. And the third generalizable power that I pull out is what I call civil power. And that is the ability to mobilize people voluntarily. So you see all his hands up saying, me, I'll do that. Um, I'll, I'll act in coordination because I choose to. And you can think about it this way and why, what, what it is about civil society being different here. Uh, to get somebody to do something, for the state to get somebody to do something has to write a law. So you have to do this. You have to go get a driver's license, whatever it is. The state writes the laws and makes you do it. Uh, someone could bribe you to do something or pay you, like you can rent your body, say, now will you go work in this factory for eight hours a day, sure, I'll pay you money. So they have to get people to move because they've given them money. It's only civil society that says, will you do this because it's the good, right thing to do? And you're like, yeah, I'll do that. So it's, it's, it's uh, the volition that gives it its power, people doing things of their own volition. Now what's important is once you understand that these are, th these are different forms of power, but they're equally generalizable, you begin to see these things I call power plays which is when generalizable, people who hold some kind of generalizable power use it not just to achieve their, their agenda, but do it particularly to minimize or weaken the other forms of power in the field. So, um, so it's, they're specifically designed to disable an opponent's arsenal by rend rendering it less generalizable vis-a-vis -vis one's own. Uh, the field of power exists at multiple spatial scales. Uh, you can utilize these scales in different ways to enhance your position. It can, you can also trace the configuration of this field, these three component parts over time. And that's the second part of this over time is what I'm really gonna be focusing on in my talk today. Um, so now let's bring it back down to earth at Lake Baikal. And I can tell you a bit about how the field of power uh, was operating as I was witnessing it during the time I spent at, 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 um, in Irkutsk. So we will uh, be looking at how civil society changes across three time periods, uh, specifically looking at how, how this, it was constrained in the Soviet Union, how it expanded in the 1990s and has once again become constrained in the 2000s. So I'll begin by talking about the field of power as it existed in the Soviet Union. So in the Soviet Union, the Communist Party, whether it, I, I understood the field of power or not, it strove to monopolize these different forms of power. So the Communist Party controlled the state and it did not allow for any competition within the state. There was a, a single party state and all other parties were forbidden. It also tried to monopolize the economy. So the state owned all industry and free forms of trade were once again also forbidden. It also tried to be civil society. So if you did have people who wanted to do things like you know, form chess clubs or protect nature or so forth. You had to affiliate your, uh, your, your activity with the Communist Party and so it had uh, this um, additional uh, claim of being, being the, civil, the only legal civil society. Free association and free speech were not part of the Soviet regime. And so there, there, that did include environmental activism and there was environmental, a form of environmental civil society in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, principally uh, the All-Soviet Society for Nature Protection, or VOLP. So, um, so this, is the, this was the, uh, the official Communist Party branch of, the, of environmental activism. And um, when you look at the archives of, uh, of the, you know, the, as I did, the local Irkutsk archives of this, of this organization, you saw that it had some interesting features. It was, it was flush with resources because it had all, all these uh, uh, Soviet citizens, re citizens were required to pay dues to organizations and a lot of them gave them to Volp and so they had lots of money. It also had lots of voice. They actually had 
a, um, uh, every other week they had a, a two-page spread in the local newspaper just talking about environmental issues, and that's amazing. Can you imagine if like the New York Times, the Washington Post had two pages just that was giving to, to Sierra Club every other week? I mean, that, that's a, that they had a lot of opportunity, but what they could actually say or do say in those newspapers to do with that money um, was really uh, dictated by by the regime in which they found themselves. And so one of the things you, you see, uh, the c types of activities that are done um, were usually n fairly non-threatening. They were very you know, happy, hunky-dory things like tree planting. And this is good. I'm not saying bad things about cl planting trees. But tree planting, making posters, passing out leaflets, um, feel good activities, but never with a, a critical bent on, in on environmental issues at the time, and certainly nothing that, that was too critical of, uh, of the state or the economy. Um, the language that, that uh, these activists were compelled to use in their speeches and proclamations sometimes bordered on ridiculous. Um, so some of my favorites. Uh, Questions of environmental protection have stood at the center of attention of the Soviet government since the first days of its existence. Now, I guarantee you in the Civil War they were not really thinking much about the environment. This is, this is a, the kind of thing that had to be said. Um, another was a, a, a children's brochure that encouraged students to love, Lenin, to love nature as Lenin loved her. Um, what is ha at stake here is essentially making sure that as much as you care about the environment, you are also associating that care with the Communist Party so that what's considered good, if the environment is considered good, so necessarily is the Communist Party, that this is lumped together. And if you think about it as kind of value, you can never, you can never move from the value of nature to a criticism. You have to go through the party to get to the value of nature. So it's lumped together as one. Um, and then uh, the other thing that, that came through, especially as um, after Perestroika, was a uh, real concern about, despite you know their existence, this this lack of ability to really act or influence. So um, I have a, a quote here that the Factory Council of Volp, its socio-technical committee, has no influence on the answers to questions of environmental protection. Regardless of state required inspections, there is no regular regulation of toxic air pollution from auto transit. So they were aware of problems. They knew problems existed. They even maybe had m metrics and measurements of of problems. For instance, the air quality in Irkutsk getting worse and worse and worse, but they felt very powerless vis-a-vis -vis the state to actually do anything or any, any leverage that they would have had over the auto industry to change its, its standards. Um, there will also be sometimes in these archives letters that people would write in talking about uh, you know, the things that they had seen or environmental concerns that they had about their own neighborhoods and, and well, had nothing that they could do with that. It was just it was an outlet but not a, no leverage on fixing the problem. But it was there, it was present, and it, it did at least maintain this uh, understanding of the environment as being important throughout this period. But it's also worthwhile to remember that the Communist Party's monopoly was never really a monopoly. It tried to dominate, but it couldn't. This was still a field of power. And how do we know it was a field of power? Because of things like this, this spontaneous uh, response to uh, the threat that the White Calls Pulp and Paper Mill was causing, that that, was, that took the state by surprise, and they were forced to try and accommodate some actions um, and to show that they too cared about, uh, about Lake Baikal, even you know, issuing a commemorative stamp the year after these protests started. So yes, actually we do care, <laughs> see, Lake Baikal. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a independent civil society, there was a field of power, but the, the, the dominance of one player made it such that it was harder for the other players to act. They had constrained that space of activity. So in, in uh, 1991, the Soviet USSR collapses, and that ushers in a new constellation for the field of power. The state is in chaos and shambles, the economy is devastated. Uh, just, yeah, uh, we don't need to go too far into that, but uh, I'm not saying that these things were good. It's not good to have um, a, a state and economy in shambles, but the interesting thing is that it did create a lot of opportunity for members of Russian uh, environmental civil society around Irkutsk. There, was, there were uh, many new political parties being for formed. There were lots of new social organizations being formed on a lot of different topics. Um, I'm going to talk about one in particular right now, which is, uh, became the strongest and the most long-lasting environmental organization in Irkutsk. Oops, sorry. And that's the Baikal Environmental Wave. So uh, the 1990s were a pretty hellish time in Russia, uh, but in my interviews and conversations with environmental activists uh, from that, the 90s, 
people who were activists still had this uh, sort of this verve in their voice when they talked about what they were doing at the time and how they were experimenting, how they were thinking about what it meant to be a, a social organization or an, or an activist, these long conversations they would have, how, how uh, much freedom they felt in terms of dictating what they would do and, and what they could influence. Um, so it was, despite the horrendousness of the 90s, it, it was also a period of discovery, experimentation, innovation, and empowerment for uh, the members of environmental civil society at The Way, for example. And I have this, uh, the energy that I heard in these interviews comes through most strongly in this quote from Jenny Sutton, who was the, one of the founder of The Wave. And she said, in the 1990s, you had this collapse of everything around you, nothing in the shops, people losing their work. Society was collapsing all around you, and yet we were building something. You felt you were doing something positive. You were creating something in the midst of this collapse. And I felt it was exciting, inspiring. And she was certainly not the only person I heard speaking with this, this uh, gusto and re recalling the early days of the wave. And the wave grew to be the strongest and most active uh, environmental organization in, that, in the region with a wide array of programs. It had uh, international name recognition. They started working with uh, educational programs, believing that people just needed to learn about the problem. But then they started to encounter real uh, threats. For example, a number of pipelines and oil and gas were being routed by Lake Baikal, and they moved into advocacy, um, monitoring, making sure that they were showing up at the, at the meetings to say, if, you, if you're having some development, what is it you're going to do? Are you following the proper protocol? Um, and uh, they were largely successful, and they were successful in preventing all the repeated pipeline attempts during this time, and keeping up pressure on on the paper mill. But its strength crescendoed around the year 2000 and started to to wane. Um, the year 2000 is also the year that Putin returned to power, or returned to power, came to power as, as uh, the president of Russia. And it also, many people don't know, it was also the, sort of a symbolic year for the, the movement away from dicky wild capitalism into these large, consolidated multinational corporations that were moving to a global market. So the, the economy began to settle as well. The, uh, the mafia had fought enough turf battles, and now we had uh, the rise of, of really organized oligarchs. And at the same time, we see the energy pass in the, the civil society, this torch pass from the wave to another organization that was formed in 2002 called the Great Baikal Trail, GBT. Uh, and this is an organization that um, is much more accommodationist in its scope. It also does a little bit of education, but it's not advocacy, it's not monitoring, they're not the ones that are paying attention to what's being constructed and is it doing it properly. What it really is about is uh, trying to be to say, yes, we want to develop, let's try and develop in, in an eco-friendly way by bringing ecotourism to the Baikal watershed and building a system of hiking trails, very lovely hiking trails, um, to encourage ecotourism. And they do these wonderful little um, two-week volunteer vacations where they bring foreigners and local Russians together to build these, again, quite lovely hiking trails. And they're very f fun, exciting, um, and they do other things as well. Um, and, uh, but there's definitely loses the, the critical edge that WAVE had in the 1990s uh, and is definitely more accommodating both to the to state and financial powers which have now reconsolidated and risen at this, in this exact same era. And some of these uh, were explained by informants of mine who were contrasting the two organizations. Um, this one, I call Katya, uh, these are all pseudonyms, says, the WAVE has a position and GBT, well, GBT has a family. We have all kinds of things we do, and we don't necessarily have a stand on them. So we're helping kids, we're picking up litter, whatever. We just help each other out. And the wave needs to have a position on whatever they do. It's, they know what it is they're against. You know, that is what it comes down to. The wave's against, and GBT is for. And another informant said in a very, you know, very similarly, the wave is a protest organization. They're always against something, against some development. GBT, I don't know how to say it. We aren't really against anything. But sometimes there are reasons to be against things, to be perfectly honest. And the WAVE's advocacy came from real commitments that valued sustainability as the most important end of a higher value on the spectrum. They, uh, they weren't always against, they were for sustainability. They were for making sure that nature was protected. And uh, that was what created the antagonisms with the state and with uh, corporate elites. And the same volunteer I quoted earlier said, you know, she acknowledged that despite the fact that she felt that 
GBT was a happier group of people, she realized they were not as environmental as the wave was. She said the wave, they practice what they preach and start talking about how they, they use water sensors to turn their water off and they unplug their computers at night. And at the at GPT office, I feel a little hypocritical because it is an environmental organization, but the office is not environmental at all. There's even this big crack right in the front window. Here we are supposed to be handing out brochures on saving energy and we ourselves have a big crack in the window going outside. So you have to see again this, this shape from this constrained terrain of activism in the Soviet Union, this, this flourishing sense of empowerment in the 90s, and then once again this, this more uh, constrained and accommodationist uh, organization that rises to prominence at exactly the same time that the advocacy organization is, is waning. Um, and now I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which uh, financial powers and state powers influence that transition. And specifically, we're looking at, at power plays. So this is when, when you use a power to disable or, or at least to limit another form of power, a threatening form of power. So I will begin by talking about the relationship between finance and civil society. So, this is Oleg Deripaska. You may have noticed him coming up sometimes in the uh, the reporting on on Manafort because he was he was Manafort's boss in Ukraine, um, and he has a holding company called the N Plus Group, and. Um, I just really uh, learned much more about this organization because I was studying environmental activism and that logo showed up just about everywhere that I went. It was really plastered over absolutely everything that I with any event that was environmental that I was at, it, there was a big N plus logo there. Um, and I started to learn more about it. And what happened is actually it was the year before I started my field work, uh, they had formed a, a corporate social responsibility division and they went to Irkutsk and went to every single environmental project and said, we want to be your corporate sponsor. Um, now there was an understanding that this was uh, not out of goodwill necessarily, but in fact was was trying to be like a Western organization, so a Western company, they're getting this from, from corporate social responsibility models that are coming out of business schools in America, for example. So some of I understand for them it's just PR. They're trying to be like a Western company. And another uh, informant who's more in the business community said, Russian business usually does its own thing. But when a business enters the international market, it discovers that the international market has its own rules of the game, including how socially responsible you are, uh, how you conduct yourselves as a business, how you give to charity, and our business understands that it must be done. Not because you want to or because you don't want to, but because that is what expected, what is expected, so now you do it. Um, so there's a sense that this is happening because of global pressure, not, not from goodwill, but the, um, but the activists, and the activists now faced a choice. So do we, as environmentalists, uh, align ourselves with this company that is, it's a metal extraction company, an energy company, um, it has many businesses that are not exactly nice to the environment. And they, they all but one, decided, yes, we're gonna align ourselves with this company. So they would say, you know, that, you know, we discussed it, they're a big corporation, we don't want them to control us, but in the end we decided that taking money wasn't giving them control, we're still independent, we still de decide what projects we're gonna do. Um, so we're gonna do this work anyway, only now we have better equipment to do it with. So we're just taking the money and we're doing what we're doing anyway, so it's a fine thing, we're just getting more money. Uh, and there's a, go I'm not gonna read all this for the sake of time, but there's a great quote down there, the second one that says, business will spend the money anyway. They will find somewhere to spend it, but they could spend it on something stupid. So I think it's much better for them to, to spend it on us, essentially, because we know that we're not gonna do something stupid. And they're not entirely wrong about that. So. Um, what corporations are trying to do in this relationship is actually to get the power of civil, to get civil power to uh, bolster their own, their, their own um, power source. So basically you have corporations that are, uh, they have money, they make money through profit, and you have civil society that makes civil power by being good, and they're trying to make, to, to trade this out. So we'll give you money, you give us your image, your good, you know, we take care of the earth image, and it's a win-win. Um, now, I actually did observe uh, some attempts by N plus to try and do this without civil society, just to do it themselves. Like, we're just gonna go out and do our own good, do good projects for the earth, and maybe then we'll be the people who look like we're doing good. Um, and I would say in regards to the spending money on something stupid, that was exactly what happened. <laughs> that um, they, they conducted this, uh, this m really media fest project that had very little environmental benefit, because what they, all they really wanted was to look good, not actually to do good. So, I ask you, is this a power play? And I would say no. 
Actually, it's not. This is not a, a play in the field of power. This is a power trade. When companies and nonprofits align, they're just, we have money, we have, we have a positive image, let's just trade these out and we can each enhance our own. Uh, that does not mean that I did not see power plays, though. And one example, and I, I really feel badly picking on this, this because I think very, very highly of the woman who runs it, but there's this, uh, there was this School for Environmental Entrepreneurship that I participated in and observed. And um, basically, it's, it's uh, a business incubator for environmental business. But I will say that in the process of participating in it, despite the fact that it was run by environmentalists, uh, it was essentially nothing more than a business incubator with, like, a, again, the, the hint of being green on it. Um, in the end, the project th that won the, the competition had the lowest score for environmental <laughs> protection, uh, and yet it had the highest, it came away with the highest score because its profits were four times, wait, was it four? It was in, I think it was five times larger than the next other business. So, and when the judges were seeing the slides and they saw the slide with the profit, literally all five of them suddenly like leaned in. Like, oh my God. So uh, what, what I, the way I, I, I examined this was that they were, like, similar to the Communist Party, it was saying, you can like the environment, but you have to like us too. It was a very similar structure that the, this, this biggest business incubator saying, okay, yes, yes, environment is good and fine, but the, the number one value is profitability. The number one value is always going to be business. And so even though we're not saying environment is bad, environmental protection is bad, it's a, lower, it's a lower level on a value hierarchy compared to the value of business. Uh, and what made this particularly a power play is that this school was enabled by N plus money. And when I asked the woman who runs it, uh, is like, so this is just a, something you've wanted to do for a long time. She said, well, no, I gave them a few projects and there's this other one that I really wanted to do that was actually much more sustainable and it was about uh, um, creating uh, opportunities for people to engage with, um, with alternative technologies and was more socializing people into alternative energy and they wouldn't fund that one. They funded the one that supported the, the logic of business. Uh, so it is a power play because you're using your financial resources to put in place to change the way people think about what is good. And that's civil power, what we think is good. So rather than thinking, rather than having the opportunity to think about alternative energy, they're thinking about how, that, how to make a business and that profitability is the highest goal. So that would be an example of, the, of a power play in the field of power with, between civil society and finance. Now I'm going to talk about uh, between civil society and the state. So just at the beginning of my field work, the, uh, the Russian government passed a law that is colloquially called the Foreign Agent Law. And this was a law that stated that all nonprofits receiving cash and other assets from foreign sources and partic participating in political activities uh, must register with the governing state agency as a foreign agent. And if you, so if you are getting money from abroad, even like if I were to give a donation to, uh, to the GBT or the WAVE, and if, uh, if you engage in political activity, however you define that, then you can be called out as a foreign agent and have to register. And if you register as a foreign agent, there are a number of disadvantages to this. One is that there's a much higher um, and more strenuous reporting requirement. So nonprofits already in Russia have to jump through a lot of hoops just to be organizations. Foreign agents have, have much more strenuous and more difficult bureaucratic uh, reporting requirements. If you are a foreign agent and you want to engage in activity that may be considered political, you have to clear it with the state agency first. So you're not able to even do the actions that you would like to do. Um, and also anything you say, whether you're talking to the media or putting out a brochure, it has to say on it somewhere, this is, um, this is coming from a foreign agent. So even a very domestic civil society group uh, like, like The Wave or GBT would technically be seen as like somehow foreign and not really representing Russia or Russians' interests. And when I was in Irkutsk, um, toward the end of my field work, so the law passed in July, uh, toward the end of my field work, by call environmental wave was caught in this net. So um, they were asked by the prosecutor to submit documents uh, twice. The second time, for example, uh, they had to provide um, all, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, it'll take forever, but grant agreements, how money was spent, any kind of list of any actions they took, copies of, of orders for business trips, accounting documents, all of these for three years, all of their fi these files for three years, and they had to provide it to the, I'll add to the prosecutor within five hours. So in addition to having um, 
being targeted by this law for prosecution, there was also this kind of uh, kind of extra legal intimidation that was going along with it. So you had this this um, almost impossible to meet uh, deadline of five hours. There were. Um, it was conveyed to them that the FSB was not pleased with them, um, so they had some kind of hints, rumors of intimidation. And then finally, uh, when the prosecutor did deem them uh, to be foreign agents, they they were very they kept that under wraps. They were not sure what to do with that. Um, and th two days later, um, they had this graffiti, a, a foreign agent, Heart USA, spray painted on their storefront. Yeah, it's misspelled. <laughs> um, now, uh, we have no idea who did this, of course. It could be Rogue Hooligan, but um, the members of the WAVE all thought that this was some, someone who was doing this at the behest of the FSB or some other representative of the state because no one knew that they had been deemed a foreign agent. That was brand new information. They hadn't shared it with anybody. And they also, there's also you know, other evidence that um, this at least was not a rogue coup again, that it was at least a coordinated action because the exact same thing was spray painted on an organization in Moscow as well. Uh, so you have um, this legal mechanism uh, for targeting organizations that are, that, that are potentially seen as, as threats. Now, um, when it comes to the requirements for being a foreign agent, getting money from abroad, engaging in political activity, uh, there were a, a number of organizations that fell into that rubric, other environmental organizations that were in, that I was uh, working with in the Irkutsk region, including GBT. Um, but it was only the wave that was targeted. Uh, and I actually uh, talked to a prosecutor, in, the city prosecutor, and learned that, that they, were, they, they were provided a list from someone higher up of which organizations they wanted them to target for this law. Uh, so it seems like at like some level there was a, a strategic meeting out of law. And we saw this again also in the financial sector where uh, particular oligarchs were targeted for um, things like tax evasion or, or money laundering after they had upset the state for various reasons. I call this legal nihilism. So the use of law for the purpose of targeting political opponents, um, not to apply as a general rule of law. Um, this signs as a uh, people's agent of Baikal. Um, Baikal Environmental Way fought this, this uh, designation in courts. It drew out for about two years, um, but they finally um, couldn't fight it any longer. They, at the end of their appeals, they were fined uh, hundreds of thousands of rubles, which they were able to raise from private local donations within a matter of a day, basically maybe two days max. Um, and then they liquidated themselves because they said it couldn't work under, this, under these conditions at all. So the organization that had been the strongest and had been really the, the, the touchstone for environmental activism in the region since you know, the early 90s uh, dissolved, and to my mind, very sadly. Um, and some activists that I spoke to um, observing this, so not members of the WAVE, but others, uh, said they were reminded, older activists, that they were reminded of the Soviet Union, that, that what the state was trying to do was to get its arms back around social organizations again. So uh, in the Soviet Union, there, was no, there were no independent organizations. Then in the 90s, they started to appear. And this was helped with financing from the West. So now you have government-sponsored organizations like VOLP and independent organizations, and this law is aimed to bring those independent organizations back into the fold. And somebody else said, uh, this is a prophylactic measure. The result is that social organizations will be more careful about what they say regarding the powers that be. So they get the use of law to create an environment whereby organizations self-regulate into constraining their own sense of, of what is worth fighting for. So I, have, I, just, I really just wanted to put this picture up because I love it. But I was like, little, little girl, hope for the future. Well, what, I, what I would say is that, that no matter what, I think that we can take away though that, that, that this, is, this is always a field, just as it, even in the Soviet Union, this, was, this is a field of power and there are always contingencies involved. And there will always be opportunities, um, whether because of exogenous shocks or in, you know, indigenous um, protest activism, that there will be opportunities for the power field to recalibrate. And, who knows what ways in the future. So um, right now, there have been a, a few um, threats to Lake Baikal that have risen up really in the last, some of them have been slowly building, like the algae blooms, but some of them have been more immediate, like a, like a threat to change the law, the uh, of law of Baikal, which is the legal um, 
uh, norms for what is allowed and not allowed in the lake, uh, and those have been met, again, with protest action, so we still see people rising up to defend the lake to this day, and that is heartening. So quickly, I'll go through the implications of the theory that I have presented to you today, the field of power. So the first is I establish the utility of the civil society concept. We can actually lump these things together because if you, whether you want to, um, to use your voluntary action to start a, uh, a chess club or to use what you, do what you think is right to persecute minorities or do what you think is right to save Lake Baikal, that is the, what, what really unites civil society is this form of power they have. And again, reconciling the dark and the light because you can't determine what people think is moral. That's flexible, that changes over time. Uh, so it's not dark and light, it's just whatever people at the moment think is good and what they're willing to work for. I've also deconstructed the ideal type of civil society, showing that it takes, it takes different forms over time. So for example, we have notions that, that civil society is, is what we do in the West, that that is civil society. And in fact, I think that you can find it a wide array of forms, and that these forms are contingent on the field of power. So we do have civil society in places like the Soviet Union, but also the civil society we have in the West is itself shaped by the field of power in the West, and that's very important to recognize. Um, I have offered a means to analyze actions taken to limit power and change the balance of power within the field and given us a language for calling these power plays. Uh, I think this theory eschews simplistic interpretation of society's heroes and villains because it really is a matter of, it doesn't matter whether it's civil society or the state or corporations that are trying to dominate the field of power, that is, that is the question, is how, t how constrained it is or how open it is for involvement. Uh, I reconcile cultural and structural powers, so you have the cultural belief of civil society versus the structure of, uh, of the economy and the state. And I think I elucidate the relationship between censorship, propaganda, and the freedom of speech, and I don't have time for that, but I'll, I'll let, you can bring it up in Q&A if you want. Um, and finally, I've explained why authoritarian leaders are so concerned about their image. Anyway, so if you want to read more, that's my book, and thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, do we have questions? If, um, if I were an activist concerned about preserving Lake Baikal, mm -hmm. and I surveyed the world of environmental activism in all its forms in various governments, where would I look for a, a useful example for how to, how to bend the actions of the people and the actions of the state and private enterprise in the, in the way that I'd like? Um, it's a very good question, and uh, what I will say is, is not probably not the most fulfilling answer that you'll receive, but I will say that, uh, again, what I hope to have shown is actually how mutable and changeable circumstances are and how important context is for understanding what your, what your movement's next steps are and why. Um, I think that, that Russia right now, um, no matter what you know, movement that you might be interested in, in supporting uh, has a, a rule of law problem. <laughs> and basically that they need to, to really bolster uh, attention to, to corruption and, I mean, they, actually there's a lot of attention on corruption right now, but that's, that is, and that's rightly so. Um, particularly because uh, so many of the, the, the willingness of people to engage voluntarily partly springs from, from, from uh, faith that in volunteering to support something, I can make a difference. Um, that to believe that, or to, and to trust that, uh, that people who are asking me to, to get involved are, are um, you know, doing it for the right reasons and not potentially you know, exploiting me. And, I, and so uh, I think that um, for a lot of issues, not just environmentalism, uh, the, that that lack of social trust, and part of the lack of social trust comes from a failure of institutions and, and certainly a failure of the rule of law, uh, breeds a kind of cynicism that makes it very difficult to get people involved. So I guess at some level you have to first get, uh, that should really be the, the locus of attention. Now of course if you have an issue, like they're about to change the law of by call and this is really bad, then that's not gonna be your answer. You're not gonna be like taking the long, <laughs> the long view of, oh, we have to fix corruption first. No, you have to immediately try and, and get on board with that. Um, 
and there are a number of other uh, ideas in the realm of uh, the scholarship on social movements that can give you more practical, immediate answers for how to go about uh, uh, meeting those needs. But again, it, it does need to be conversant with the, with the particular context. That it, so for example, um, disruptive tactics, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. You have to be attentive to the context of w why that would be the case. Or if you have, um, if you have uh, very functional institutions, then using a legal strategy to use the courts, for example, that, that's a, a very legitimate means to, 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 uh, to reach your end. So again, not a very fulfilling answer, but I would say be very attentive to your context and decide if you're looking at short-term answers or if you're having a long-term approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, was, I read an article and um, it was talking about who the winners of global warming will be and who the losers will be. Um, and this article actually talked about how Russia's economy would benefit from, will benefit from global warming and actually Putin himself said, has said that. Like, I know this is controversial, controversial but um, we will, our economy will benefit. So what would the effects be on like by call? Um, because would they be good? Or, because I really <laughs> doubt that. Okay, can people hear the questions? Okay. Um, I could th answer my thoughts on this, but I also have um, actual you know, environment, ecologists who are probably more averse. I mean, I'm a social scientist. I can tell you what I think that I would get the right answer, which is um, it would be bad for Lake Baikal. Um, first, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, the lake's water level could drop if it's not seeing enough rain or enough snowpack to, to fill in. Uh, and if the lake drops below a certain level, it can be hazardous for the whole ecosystem because, for example, fish can't get to their shallow breeding grounds. Because um, remember, it's just it's a fault line that's split apart, so it's extremely n narrow and deep, and there are very few shallows. Um, also, and then for the human inhabitants, um, you have all kinds of groundwater problems associated with the water level drop. They've actually seen a preview of this a couple years ago. Uh, the other thing is, remember I told you that the lake is oxygenated all the way to the bottom? We, we don't know exactly why that's the case, I don't think, but most people think it has something to do with the cold because no other, no other deep lake does this. So there's something about, uh, they think, the extreme cold of Baikal that is allowing this water to turn. And remember, the ecosystem is really specifically designed for the fact that you have this, this abundant life at, at the very, very base of it that is feeding part of the whole food chain. Um, I don't think anyone would say that, that climate change is going to be a, a boon for Baikal. Um, and I think that I have, I would, have I, would, I would push back on Putin a little bit on that too. <laughs> <laughs> that some of the, the dreams I have of, of uh, a fertile crescent in Siberia is also probably misplaced. <laughs> or maybe the, the oil they can now tap from the melted Arctic, et cetera, et cetera. But yes? Um, I have a question about this like, concept of civil society and how, like, particularly in like, Russian context, like how you have like, the ethnic Russians and then the people, and they're kind of dominant in civil society, and the people that have been kind of precluded from civil society for long term. So, like, how in this like context of environmental activism can you like incorporate those people that have been included, like kind of ostracized from civil society in the past? Mm -hmm. um, do you have specific examples? Mm, I guess like well, I guess in like a more like Mongolian context, mm -hmm. um, like there have been people that are like involved in like if you live in the city, you have a lot more role to play in like what is going on in your environment. And if you're like in the rural areas, you like, don't really have that sort of say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just like an urban world divide thing, mm -hmm. than, like an ethnic divide, but like mm -hmm. those exist as well. Yeah. They they do exist. Russia's an uh, incredibly multi ethnic state, and it's very it's it's um, very visible at Baikal. Um, but I, I, the, I don't. Uh, I th I, I, my observation of, of the, the environmental movement, at any rate, was that it was quite ecumenical and very broad-based. Um, and I didn't, I don't know, maybe Central Asian traders didn't show up necessarily, but, but the people who were local came from a, a wide array of groups, um, uh, socioeconomic classes. Now, the leaders, the leaders are by and large educated, and they're, they're intelligentsia, they're uh, professionals, um, not uniformly Russian and ethnics, but um, but of a class, I would say. Um, but in terms of participants, it was very broad-based. Um, 
What I would uh, point back to, I guess it also just, uh, I know when you when you develop a theory, you start to see everything through your theory, uh, is to to recognize that that is. I mean, I see that also as, as a question of, of democracy and power. So the extent to which people who are having their lives impacted have um, the ability to to sway an outcome, and so um, that is uh, that is paying attention to how power is distributed in society, and, and I would argue is is vitally important. So the extent to which that's failing to happen, well, um, yes, <laughs> yes, human society. <laughs> but, um, but if you're gonna make a normative claim about how to go about producing a good society, I would argue for inclusion. Yeah. Do you have right, just the same yeah. Yeah. Grace? Yeah, Grace. Oh, sorry. Um, I oh, do you think that there could be another organization more like Baikal Environmental Wave that could spring up, or do you think at this point the, the sort of state barriers to that are too high? No, it could absolutely happen. Um, they, I mean, they have this, this uh, this precarious law, but they actually know what it says, and they can, I mean, if, if you're moving forward, you can strategically decide how to go about meeting that, how to, uh, uh, I think that the safest bet is to uh, find ways around receiving any kind of foreign funding, um, because not, one of the, one of the definitions of, of, of uh, political activity in this law is trying to influence public opinion. It's kind of hard to be a movement and not try to influence public opinion. So, not getting involved, po getting involved in politics. That's that's not going to be something you're going to avoid. Um, but um, I think that the dem well, I would say that this. So this is one iteration of this law. Um, but there have been there have been other uh, legal attempts to try and, and alter the shape, uh, to alter the the number of the number of public opinion shapers in Russia. Essentially, so we have we've seen the similar law now being um, being directed towards the news media, and that's after already the the state has taken over most of the independent news media. Uh, they're talking about um, channeling all inter uh, uh, digital communication through a state agency, so that they, even though they're saying this is not going to be like China, it gives them the opportunity to be like China, <laughs> with, um, even maybe not even disclosing that. It's it's very concerning. Um, uh, Practice so yes, I think that you can have an uh, you can have a strong uh, social organization like the Wave that avoids the, the foreign agent law, but you don't know what other kinds of things are are going to be shaping your ability to mobilize the public. And one of them may be a constrained discursive sphere that um, enables certain people to help shape the public's knowledge of information and and to help sh shape um, social values of what is good and worthy activity. Very similar to um, to the pr same kind of processes that we saw, that I was describing with the Soviet Union. I'm not saying it's the Soviet Union, it's not, but I, I think that understanding the process is, is helpful to then see how I in a different form this same process can play out in other contexts. So as I've mentioned earlier in discussions, uh, once you think about civil power in this way, then you can think about um, this um, last one that I didn't talk about nearly enough, the means by which distorting the public sphere through censorship or, or propaganda or fake news or so on and so forth actually does uh, impact what that foundation of civil power. And you can try if you have you know money or, or state powers to alter the conditions that would uh, encourage or discourage the formation of a threatening form of civil power. Civil power is fine if it's, if it's on your side, like cause marketing, and that's one reason why I bring up that case. There are ways that these different powers can cooperate, and sometimes to mutual benefit, but sometimes it's decidedly to, for the purpose of, of minimizing the threat that another poses. Yeah, um, thank you for a terrific talk. I mean, I'm looking at the Baikal region in totally new ways since reading the book and listening to your comments. Um, and as you know, Professor Moore and I are going to be bringing 11 undergraduates to this region this summer. Um, we're only going to be there for three and a half weeks. Um, in your work, you were there for many months, um, and you, know, you had studied a lot of Russian, so you had the language. Um, but I was wondering if, if perhaps you could offer advice to, to our undergraduates who are going to be going there based on how you got better as an observing social scientist 
over the course of those months you were there. I, I would assume that you, you, you know, were able to observe norms, values, and sanctions better mm -hmm. and, and sort of more um, uh, insightfully as time went by. Oh. You sort of got, you know, developed your toolkit a little, a little better. I'm wondering, can you give advice sort of to our um, undergrads? What are the things you sort of wish you had known, and what are the tools you wished you had in your observational toolkit when you hit the hit the ground when you first got to Russia? That maybe you can suggest that they work on to be ready for what they're going to see in a much shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are two different questions. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna bracket the one of what I didn't what I didn't know when I got there, and say instead that the piece of advice I would have is uh, from that perspective is keep a journal. Um, <laughs> What? <laughs> Good job. Um, so first of all, when I was just studying abroad for my first time as a college student, before I had any thoughts of being a social scientist, I mean, this was this was absolutely vital for me. My first year in Russia was was keeping a, a journal is what kept me sane and and um, uh, was incredibly useful. So I highly recommend it. Um, but also, I'm an ethnographer, and literally, what an ethnographer does is we participate in, in social life and we write down everything that happens. And so a lot of the analysis actually happens after we leave the field. So I had some thoughts and ideas about things that I'd seen, um, but that reflection didn't really happen in the field. Um, I, I had some inklings that, that I mean, I, clearly I was living through the foreign agent law and its repercussions for the wave. So I knew that something was gonna, some part of my project was definitely gonna deal with, with, this, with the state. Uh, and I was participating in all these N plus sponsored activities, so I had a feeling that was gonna be playing in, in the, the final analysis. But what you do is you keep your journal, you take your field notes, uh, and then you go back and you study them and you read them and you code them and you find parallels and patterns and, and trace them out and then you think, okay, so is this what I'm seeing? And you think about the literature that exists and then you think, well, if what else might it be? And can you find evidence of this other, of any other hypotheses? And you just interrogate your data back and forth and back and forth. And a lot of the heavy intellectual lifting actually doesn't happen when you're there. It happens when you go home. And I'm not saying that in your month you're gonna go write an ethnography, but uh, keep a journal. And if you really do wanna think more deeply about the experience, then read your journal when you get back <laughs> and, and process it in, in that context. Um, so no, but even, like I said, even before I was a social scientist, I, I, my first trip to Russia, I, kept a, I avidly kept a journal and I was very grateful I did that, so. Good job. Are there, are there any, of course, Jay? Jay, I did want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. and, um, I really enjoyed your talk as well. Could you just go back one slide? My book? The cover of your book is really beautiful. Aww. Really <laughs> it. Yeah, it's a Look at it. Thank um, you. My, my question is following up on this larger concept of a civil society. And when you first started to introduce it, introduce it you made a brief reference to Earth First, which got my oh. <laughs> Because I'm still trying to figure out you know, what the boundaries are. And as I understood it, right, a civil society is folks kind of voluntarily coming together, shaped by historical context, but uh, works towards something that they think of as being in the common good. good. Um, and it, you know, civil also implies that there's certain norms of behavior, right? Whether they're maybe sanctioned in different ways. And mm -hmm. it's just kind of, well, the question is both historical and conceptual. The historical part is, were there any kinds of extra legal activities like Earth First undertook? So Earth First is a radical environmental group that <coughs> took direct action to uh, try and protect forests and block development projects in, in the US primarily. Were, were there any analogs to that in Russia? And then it, 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 is there a point at which these organizations cross them out in which they're no longer part of civil society? And society, and I guess- mm, Like society, vote, maybe? <laughs> they you know, break the law. Right, um, mm -hmm. you, you brought up the Ku Klux Klan, where you know part of that was lynching people. So right. I'm wondering, like, where is the boundary? At some point, do such organizations no longer fit within the realm of the civil society? I'll answer the second part first, and that is, I wouldn't let the language of civil confuse you to think that it means any kind of. Um, I mean, it's 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 normative based, but I would say it's contingent on the group that is participating. Uh, so one way that I think about it, when you talk about, say, I mean, this is what people are talking about: the dark side of civil society. Yes, lynchings are civil society if you if you are following this political theory, um, and uh, and so what. Uh, what we see is this, uh, with what, what makes that you know, illegal, literally, is uh, the state enforcing um, 
uh, enforcing a, a lack of generalizability over civil society by enshrining individual rights and, and, and due process and whatnot. So this is, this is a state action to keep civil society from being concentrated. That it, making sure that minority rights are protected prevents civil power from being concentrated to the degree that it can undermine uh, the, that, that, um, it, that it can keep that power sufficiently diffuse that there is more input from lots of different kinds of groups. So um, I put this in my book. So uh, in pluralist societies, we don't actually, we have, some, we have different l levels of, you can think of uh, maybe Venn diagrams or concentric circles of norms. And some of them are, very, are shared by very few people. <laughs> You know, like the Ku Klux Klan, and some of them are broad, like you know, maybe people who believe in rule of law and democracy. So, what I, the way I describe civil power as being generalizable, it's generalizable because you could always have the potentiality of getting a, a person just to agree with you. That's a potentiality, and so your power, your civil power, is is the most generalizable to the extent that more people buy into it, right? So. Uh, looking at all the different forms and shapes of civil society groupings in a polity determines kind of the, the sense of the broadness or, the, cons or the, the narrowness of that polity's sense of morality. And the more something is considered generally moral and good, the more power it has. And that's why people who, who uh, <coughs> at this moment in time, at this particular juncture in time, um, we don't look upon, uh, uh, well, most Americans don't look upon infringing on uh, civil liberties of others as a good thing. So it has, that speaking from that language garners you more power and more cooperation. Um, but that is variable. It doesn't have to be that way. It is that way because we've, we've chosen that, that to be that way and that's because, uh, because we actually have a state that, that uh, is democratic, which means that, here, let me show you another slide. <laughs> so this is me thinking through power plays at the level, a more abs even more abstract level. Um, so essentially, if you have, if you're a holder of one of these kinds of power, um, how you would you could limit seek to limit another form of power, and what with state power basically oh this is a terrible one Did I? okay no here it is civil power being the aggressive uh, power I got it backwards the, the state power is not necessarily naturally you know democratic if you have state power you'd much rather just wield it wouldn't you. If you really had the ability to control all the rules and, and, all, and enforce them all, wouldn't you rather just do that? Do you have to go through all this uh, difficulty of representation and suffering and rule of law? That was groups of people demanding it of the state and achieving it by limiting the state's power, and by saying, no, you're going to be beholden to us. So what, what we say is good and right, we vote for and put into place. And so you have a norm, a social norm, that is, uh, that is believing more or less in individual rights, and, and so we put those into laws. And then those laws actually then prevent uh, civil power from becoming too concentrated so that, so that majority runs, the majority can run rampant over minorities. Does that make sense? And so it's a way to legally make sure that civil power remains open and, and at least uh, somewhat diffuse. We do that again also with, with the state, um, for example, by limiting it through representative government. Um, uh, so there, there are various ways. So for example, um, something we forget, and maybe because of my anthropology background, I know this a bit better, but through much of human society until the Enlightenment, there were, there were uh, mechanisms by which culture kept people from being a little too, um, too uh, boastful or, or rich or putting, putting their, their wealth on display or even sometimes they would be means by which you accrued status by even giving what you had away. So that was an attempt by which society tried to keep in check things that would, uh, that would pull society apart like the uh, accrual of too much financial wealth. So we have all these different examples of means by which, by which power is kept in check and these different powers are, are made. More narrow. So I'm not. So it's essentially it's. I'm not, uh, it's uh, the way I the way I'm 
trying to explain is that a small minority of people think that uh, that that um, some hardcore direct action is worthwhile, but they, are, they lost popularity because that was not a generally shared norm. So their power, their civil power is actually quite small, vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Sierra Club, because we actually um, are more likely to think highly of people who are uh, following the rules and accommodationists and so forth. So basically I'm looking at the strength of civil power and different, so different, different wielders in civil society have different levels of civil power. I hope it helped. I have like a historical uh, mm -hmm. question. So are there any examples of these types of I'm trying I was trying to think. Um, I don't want to be I don't I don't want to say no and be and be wrong. I, um, but I can't think off the top of my head of a of a of Russian eco terrorism <laughs> so over to use that to use that language. Um, I'm not saying there isn't, I just can't think. Yeah, I I'm, I'm unaware of that. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>